In this post, we're going to look at the super rich and the meritocratic elite, the two groups that populists and those with populist sympathies find most objectionable. And we're going to talk about what might be done, how these groups might be persuaded to change their behavior in ways that might diffuse some of the crisis. Again, there is more background on this entire series of posts on the website, including a description of massively parallel peace building and the whole series of posts in which we've tried to analyze and identify ways more constructively addressing authoritarian populism. And we've been phrasing all of this in terms of our massively parallel peace building idea. And again, there are a series of posts on that, which out breaks the conflict problem up around four major challenges. And we've been talking about all the others so far. And what I want to highlight in this post is actually challenge number four, where we talk about imagining a future that we'd all like to live in. And this is something that we just don't have at the moment. We had a vision, or some of us had a vision, of a relatively homogeneous world in which we'd like to live, where everybody pretty much agrees with us. Uh, but that's not the challenge that we're facing. And what I want to try to do is to look at some of the issues that we need to address if we're going to have a vision that really works. And for this post, what I want to do is build on this sort of funny pyramid diagram that I developed in these earlier mapping posts that imagines that we really have a three-way conflict with the uh, progressive liberal democratic left on the left and the conservative right on the right. And then at the top, there are folks who were less attached to the political differences and more interested in um, a dominant position in society. At the very top, you have these aspiring plutocrats and authoritarians, and their real goal is to do whatever it takes um, to gain power over the larger society. And the strategy for doing that has involved a lot of divide and conquer politics, and that's the challenge that we're working with. But I don't want to convey the impression that everybody who's super rich is evil, uh, which is pretty popular, and billionaire bashing is great sport. Uh, but maybe the first place to start is by imagining what a world would look like in which the very, very rich recognize their privileged position in society and it took steps to use that position in the associated wealth to advance the common good of everyone. And here one set of things to think about are strategies for encouraging meaningful philanthropy of the kind that really makes a difference for in the lives of a great many people. And here Bill Gates has, I think to his credit, Melinda's credit as well, um, done a pretty exemplary job of figuring out how to actually apply an enormous amount of wealth to the healthcare challenges the world faces. And we could imagine, especially those of us who are connected with folks who are very, very rich, uh, putting together a set of appeals to try to get these guys to do the right thing. And there's another angle that you could take on this, of course, and this also makes a lot of sense. And this is a uh, interesting article written by a guy who at least claims to be a plutocrat, which I assume means he's got at least a billion dollars. And he's trying to explain to his fellow very, very rich folks that it's in their enlightened self-interest to address rather than exacerbate some of these big divisions and inequities in society. And that the way in which the very rich have, and I talked about this in an earlier post, 
uh, managed to accumulate such a huge share of the growth in the economy over the last 30 or so years is something that they need to roll back. And he makes a pretty persuasive pitch from the perspective of one plutocrat to another about the need for social equity and redistribution and fixing the economy. And you know, again, going back to the last post, figuring out how we can make an economy that works for everybody. And again, at this level of imagining the world with how the very, very rich might interact in a better way, I think, and this is something that has to do more with the way everybody else thinks about it, is that one can imagine <laughs> these rich guys will somehow uh, use all of their wealth to um, distribute some of it to you. So you here in this sort of silly little diagram of imagining gold bricks that are coming your way. But something that we all ought to do, and again, this is something groups could mobilize to try to highlight, is that it's not okay to try to advance your interests by, it, by selling your soul to the devil, in essence, um, to throwing your support by, behind somebody whose real agenda is authoritarian and seeks to subvert the basic demographic, democratic, with a small d, not a democratic party, but a small d democratic values on which our society is based and lots of other societies behind the United States and the focus on the common good. So those are three areas in which you might want to try to think about a vision for the very rich. Now, at the next level, uh, where we're talking about the meritocracy, uh, in this diagram, it was the top 19.9% people. The next tier down are different percentages. But uh, here, and this is something I also talked about in an earlier post, um, this group has an enormous number of advantages. And there are lots and lots of ways in which privilege and luck and hard work are all interlocking with one another in ways that is giving this sort of top tier of society pretty much a lock on the top tier. And they are arguably in many ways, the new American or global aristocracy. And it's pretty hard to figure out how this is going to change, though I think we really ought to try very, very hard. So the question becomes, OK, if you're in this group and are so lucky and privileged and have all this education and training and have jobs that really direct the course of society, uh, what's your obligation to the larger society? Now, noblesse oblige was something that we thought pertained to the older of the old aristocracy, but we need something now. And I don't think this group has given enough thought to what they owe the larger society. And that's something, again, that small groups of people could convene discussions among you know, privileged professionals and what is it that they ought to do? Another thing that's important is how this group thinks about itself with respect to the larger society. And here, I think there is a tendency to be a little bit condescending, maybe a lot condescending toward others. Uh, people at the top here think, tend to think that they got there because they're really, really smart and uh, it's all hard work and not too much of it's luck, and that they're somehow special and different. And folks further down the social hierarchy respond to that with a lot of resentment. And that resentment is also a big driver in this whole series of conflicts that are tearing society apart. So one another thing to think about is how should the meritocracy imagine its role in the society? 
<clears throat> and it seems to me that they'd be a lot better off if they thought of themselves as just another trade, whether it's the building construction trades here, the folks who uh, build highways, maintain highways, folks who, you know, nurses and orderlies and everybody in hospitals or people in a wide range of social roles. And I think we'd be a lot better off if the meritocracy said, well, I, I'm a lawyer or I'm a professor or I'm a scientist or whatever. And it's just another role. And just as electricians or firemen or policemen can get people killed if they don't do their job right, if I don't do my job right, I can help society make decisions that will harm lots of other people. And well, maybe I should get a little bit more pay because I went without pay for all those extra years that I went to school and all that money I had to borrow shouldn't be all that much more. Um, there's this old Marxian phrase that actually makes a certain amount of sense, that everybody should contribute to the society according to their ability. People in the meritocracy maybe do have some greater abilities, uh, but if they think of themselves as just another one of the workers that make society work, and with associated humility, I think we'd be a lot better off. Now, another step in this is that I think those in upper class communities um, need to cultivate a lot more respect uh, for working class trades. I remember I was on the high school and middle school, you know, parent advisory boards. And there was all this stuff about self-esteem for students and holding people in esteem. But the thought of anybody from one of the schools in nice high-tech Boulder actually working in a building trade as opposed to being a law doctor or professor or something was a step too far. And this is a, just an interesting anecdotal article about the trouble folks around Tallahassee, this is even before the hurricane, um, are having finding people in the building trades. And the statistic that sort of got me uh, was that the average age of the framers, the guys who put up the two by fours on uh, their businesses was 57. We've got to the point where we've looked at these working class jobs with such low esteem that people aren't going into them and we don't have that. And again, we'd be a lot better off if we recognize the contributions that everybody at all different hierarchical levels of society makes. Since Donald Trump was elected president, an awful lot has been written about the way in which he embraces fake facts and the contempt with which he holds the nation's traditional elites, the folks who used to run the country. And the truth is that this contempt and this hostility toward the elites is shared by a pretty large fraction of the population. In fact, that's a big part of the energy underlying populism. Now, in all of the stuff that's been written, um, there's a lot of complaints that the elites don't get the respect that they deserve, but there's been very little that I've seen in terms of self-questioning on the part of elites over whether or not they're really doing a good job of earning the public's trust. So take this list of some of the, the big sectors in society. For in the financial sector, the elites produced the 2008 crash. Uh, which took us over a decade to get past, and we're still not really past it, and increasing inequality, dramatically increasing inequality. The legal sector have produced what seems, at least to an awful lot of folks, like a gigantic array of loopholes for the powerful and stifling regulations for everybody else. Government has produced mostly acrimony and dysfunction, the technology sector it seems to have turned out privacy violations, which are being sold to advertisers who are trying to trick us. 
higher education is really unaffordable education for a huge section of the or segment of the population and the research that is produced is often very disconnected and irrelevant to the lives of everyday people. The business sector has produced race to the bottom wages and the security sector got us the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan which seemed to drag on forever. So I think that you know one of the keys for rebuilding trust in elites is for elites to start asking hard questions about whether or not they're really earning that trust and how they could do their job of serving the population as a whole more effectively. In the next and final post, we're going to look at strategies for mitigating the conflict between the democratic left-leaning protected classes and their supporters and sympathizers and those on the more conservative side, the Republican leaning, the left behind. And we're going to talk about how these groups might realize that they actually have a lot of common interests.